Thank you, Dr. Skousen. It is indeed a unique privilege for me to be tonight at the Freeman Institute. Some years ago, when the Freeman Institute had a program in Saldotna, Alaska, I had my first encounter with the constitutional truths that they were teaching, and from that point until this, I have had a very, very high regard for the work that each of you are doing in the Freeman Institute. There has never been a gasoline shortage in America. There has never been an energy crisis in America. Gasoline tomorrow morning at the gas pump could be less than 50 cents per gallon, and the service station attendant would not take one penny's cut in profit, and the oil companies would not make one cent less than what they're making right now. Your electric bills, it was planned in 1976 to start raising them in 1980. I was sitting in the meeting when I heard it discussed that by executive order of the President of the United States of America that your electric bills in every state in America and your natural gas bills would start rising in 1980 and would either double, triple, or quadruple by the end of the 80s. All sound startling? And how gasoline could be less than 50 cents a gallon at the gas pump tomorrow morning? Well, let's begin back where it all began. In 1973, when we had the first announced energy crisis in America, I honestly believed there was a gasoline shortage. Didn't you? After all, why shouldn't I? There were long lines of people at the gas pumps. The newspapers had said it, the television showed it, the government proclaimed it, why shouldn't I believe it? That year, I was a missionary in the state of Alaska. 1974 began the construction phase of the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline. And I decided that the best way to help my country out of the dilemma that it was in and to serve the Lord that I love was to offer my services as chaplain on the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline. After all, I had heard that pipeliners were supposed to be about the most wicked, cussingest, drinkingest folks on the face of the earth. And when I arrived on the pipeline, I found out that was the understatement of the year. <laughs> In June of 1974, I was assigned, without pay, the chaplain to the northern sector of the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline. Now, the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline was that four-foot diameter, largest pipe ever constructed on the face of the earth that was to flow oil from the monstrous new oil find, Prude Oil Bay, on the Arctic Ocean, 800 miles south to Valdez, Alaska, where the gasoline would finally wind up in your gas tanks here. About six months after we'd been assigned chaplain on the pipeline, they announced to us one day that since we chaplains weren't being paid anything, they were going to give us executive status. I had never been an executive on anybody's board except the Lord's and didn't have the slightest idea what it meant. But I was to find out in a few months' time that it meant I could go anywhere I wanted to, see anything I wished to see, be there when wells were tested and fields were brought in, sit in on board meetings with the executives of the oil companies in an advisory capacity. 1975, I asked permission to invite some special guests to come to the pipeline and speak in the work camps for which I was responsible. And that summer, I invited Senator Hugh Chance, a very distinguished gentleman from the state of Colorado, who, by the way, writes the foreword to my book, The Energy Non-Crisis, stating that he actually came to the oil field and proved the facts recorded in this book. Senator Chance came to the pipeline, spent a week with me, and while he was there, it was only proper that he be given a tour of the oil facility. He and the field manager, Mr. Ken Fromm, senior executive with Atlantic Richfield, Started out there early that morning, Senator Chance asked questions. Answers were given him. He seemed a little surprised at the answers. He said, can you document it? Documentation was shown him. Seismic indications, a mock-up of the field, out to a drill site. All day long this went on. Late that afternoon, Senator Chance came back to my dorm room at pump station one, sat down with a very worried look on his face, and said, Lindsay, I can hardly believe what I've seen and heard here today. <clears throat> I said, Hugh, what do you mean? He said, Lindsay, just a few weeks ago, I was sitting in the Senate of the state of Colorado when the men came from Washington, D.C., from the Department of Interior to brief us as state senators as to the energy crisis. But he said, Lindsay, 
For what I have seen here today and the documentation I have been shown, I have come to realize that almost everything that I was told in that top level briefing in the Senate of Colorado was the exact opposite to what the truth really is. He said, undoubtedly, I was intentionally misbriefed. Can you imagine our utter dismay as Senator Chance went back the following day to ask this oil company official further questions and very definitely went home proving that what he had been told by men from Washington, D.C. was an intentional misbriefing in the Senate of Colorado? This was the first inkling I had there was no, no true energy crisis. Well, what was a natural thing to do? Start looking. And that I did. A few days later, I was sitting with some oil company executives and I heard them explaining where the next energy crisis in America was going to be six to nine months in advance. I said, gentlemen, for goodness sakes, if you know where it's going to be, why don't you do something about it? Possibly you may remember that the first part of America to have a gasoline shortage was the Northeast. The rest of the country had plenty of gasoline. Then the Northeast had plenty of gasoline and California had a shortage. Then the Northeast and California had plenty and the Midwest farming area had a shortage. The truth of the matter was that America, in advance, had been intentionally sectionalized and was being tried section by piece by piece with an artificial phony energy crisis that never existed. The third chapter in my book, The Energy Non-Crisis, is entitled, Shut Down That Pipeline. I was actually able to document a major cross-country pipeline that was ordered by the federal government closed down in 1973 for the purpose of helping to create the first energy crisis on the East Coast. Some people call Pearl Harbor the day of infamy. I like to call the day that I describe in my book as Gull Island will blow your mind the day of infamy. I shall never forget it. It was an ordinary day. I walked into base camp up on the big oil field and beside the door was a security guard and I said, hey, by the way, who's around today that I could get in the pickup truck and ride with to get out where the guys are? Well, the security guard said, Mr. He called an oil man by name. He said, if you happen to come by today, chaplain, to stay around, he thinks you might like to see something exciting. Well, I said, I'm always in for excitement. What's going to happen? About that time, the oil company executive walked down the stairwell, spotted me beside the security guard and said, hey, chaplain, come on and hop in the pickup truck with me and let's go out to West Dock. Well, I said, fine. And as we rode along in the pickup truck, he said, do you know where Gull Island is? Well, I said, I've seen that drill rig sticking out up in the Arctic Ocean for about four to five miles out. You've been drilling for six or eight months. He said, yes, that's Gull Island. But I said, what's going to happen at Gull Island exciting today? Well, he said, chaplain, today we're going to do a burn at Gull Island. Well, I said, that's nice, but explain to me what's a burn. Well, chaplain, we think we have struck another major pool of oil. And today we're going to release some oil from that pool and check the chemical analysis and the pressure of the field. And we know the cattle roach zone is 15,000 feet down because of our drilling. And today we're going to check to see what's there. About that time we arrived at the west dock. That's the big dock sticking out into the Arctic Ocean where the flotilla comes in every year. And then he explained a few more technical details and all of a sudden a big black cloud of smoke went up into the sky. The wind caught it, moved it off to the west. He jumped out of his pickup truck with his binoculars in his hand. The longer he looked, the more air of excitement I could see about him. He came back to the truck and he said, Chaplain, let's head back to base camp. I want to see the documentation coming in off the microwave from out at the test site where Mr. Anderson is. Well, I said, great. We arrived back in his office. There was a table about half the size of this table, maybe a half a dozen men sitting around it. And I, I kind of pushed in amongst them and I said, by the way, gentlemen, what's going on? One looked up at me with a smile all over his face and he said, Chaplain, we've just done it. Well, I said, great, you've just done what? He said, we have just drilled into and proven another major pool of oil at Duck Island, Flaxman Island, and Gull Island called the Catarochic Zone. But I said, that's fine, but what does that mean for Americans that are standing in line waiting on gasoline? Well, he said, you see, Chaplain, years ago, we oil companies came up here to the north slope of Alaska. And we found by our seismic work that there were some big pools of oil up here. And so we decided we would drill into one of those pools. So we drilled into the Prudhoe Bay oil pool. 
And he said, Chaplain, that one Prudhoe Bay pool is going to supply enough oil to fill up the Trans-Alaska oil pipeline at the rate of two million barrels of oil every 24 hours for over 40 years. Now, he said, Chaplain, today we have just drilled into and proven another major pool of oil. Basically, what this means is, Chaplain, that our other seismic indications around the North Slope of Alaska are also correct. Chaplain, tomorrow morning, it should be headlines on every newspaper in America. Huge new oil find. <clears throat> America energy independent. No more Arab oil needed. Well, believe you me, I went to bed that night not counting sheep jumping over a picket fence to get me to sleep but counting barrels of oil traveling down America's own pipeline and winding up in the gas tanks of you people right here. Next morning, first thing I want to do is head through Chow Line bright and early and get back to base camp and look at the Anchorage and Fairbanks headlines on the newspapers. I arrived back at base camp, I spoke to the security guard just as I walked in, and he said, Chaplain, we've been looking for you for the last hour or two. He said, I want you to go right upstairs and sit down in Mr. He called the man's name I'd been with before, the day before, in his office. Well, I said, fine, but if you don't mind, I'd just like to look at the newspapers that just came in on Wien Airlines' first flight. No, no, he said, Chaplain, don't look at any newspapers, don't want you to talk to a soul. You just go right upstairs and sit down in his office. Well, I said, okay, if that's the way you're going to put it. In a few moments, the oil company executive walked in, closed the door, sat down across the desk from me, looked up at me, never cracked a smile, and said, Chaplain, I'm sorry I showed you what I did yesterday. I really wasn't supposed to. I hope you won't tell too many people about that, because if you do, you might get us both in trouble. But I said, sir, this is phenomenal. Huge new oil find America energy independent. No, he said, chaplain, not today, nor anytime soon from the Cattle Roachick Zone, because you see, we've just been ordered by the government to classify the documents, not to release the information of find, to remove the rig, to cap the well. There will be more production from Gull Island anytime soon by order of the federal government. Nine years has gone by. They've drilled for over 60 miles to the east. As one oil company official said to me just a few weeks ago, he said, Chaplain, it's one of the largest pools of oil ever discovered on the face of the earth. It goes from Prudhoe Bay all the way hundreds of miles to the east past the Canadian border. It is without comparison on this earth. Yet America's economy is starved for lack of cheap oil. You know, I can almost look at your faces after 28 years of public speaking and tell what you're thinking. I'm sure the most of you must be saying, Wait a minute, Mr. Williams. All this is well and good, but can you prove it? For the next few moments' time, I'd like to document everything I've just said. Not only that, but go further. I offer for your inspection some men in Washington, D.C. who have written on this very subject. In fact, there are a number of people in Washington who know what I've just said. Mr. Larry McDonald, 7th District, Georgia, on the official letterhead stationery of the Congress of the United States of America. Five terms in the Congress. He writes, Dear Mr. Williams, thank you for your letter and a copy of your book. It is not just the North Slope. There is enough oil all around the country to handle our energy needs for many decades. The federal government is the problem, and I've said so on many occasions. Sincerely, Larry McDonald. There's another man in Washington, D.C. who knew the truth before he was persuaded to change his mind, Mr. Ronald Reagan, President of the United States of America. This is taken from the Rocky Mountain News, Denver, Colorado, on Wednesday, February the 20th, 1980, entitled, Reagan's Alaska Oil Remark. Mr. Reagan, when he was running for the presidency, made the statement three times in the public to the media, there is as much crude oil in Alaska as there is in Saudi Arabia. Some of you may remember his statement. Remember what happened within two to three days' time after he made that statement? So many government agencies came down on him with all of their force until he withdrew his statement, apologized, and has never made it since. One congressman became so concerned about that until he decided to place in the congressional record statements that there has never been an energy crisis, that the crisis of the early 70s was phony, artificial, planned ahead of time, a literal master piece of documentation. And there's not a congressman that can't say he didn't hear it. It's in the congressional record. 
How about a very reputable newspaper, the Wall Street Journal, dated Monday, March the 15th, 1982. I dare to say that the majority of you business people listen or read this from time to time. It quotes Mr. Watt, present Secretary of the Interior. I quote, Mr. Watt says, the United States has never had an energy shortage. Front page, Wall Street Journal. Surprising? <clears throat> Possibly if those words from reputable individuals did not startle you, I could send some cold chills up and down your spine. Now the snow outside may do it, but I'll do it in a nice warm building. I need you to do something for me though before I do. Will you please set your mental computers in motion? I would like you to program four items into those mental computers. Ready? Number one, official stationery of the United States Department of Interior. Second item, the date on the letter. Please remember it. I will ask for a recall of it in a moment. May 7, 1981. Third item, signature on the letter. Official signature of the United States Department of Interior Assistant Secretary of Energy and Minerals. Fourth item, before I give it, may I elaborate on the letter so you'll understand it. Mr. Bud Thorpe, average everyday business person just such as some of you here, wrote the Department of Interior and he said, is Mr. Williams' book credible or isn't it? Is he correct or is he incorrect? The Assistant Secretary of Energy and Minerals wrote back to Mr. Bud Thorpe and he states, here goes, item number four. No large oil fields have been found in northern Alaska since the Prudhoe Bay discovery. Two expressions in that sentence I need to clarify. Number one, no large oil fields have been found in northern Alaska. What is northern Alaska? Northern Alaska is a vast area. It extends over 1,500 miles east and west. It's 130 to 160 miles deep from the Brooks Mountains to the Arctic Ocean. No large oil fields have been found in northern Alaska since the Prudhoe Bay discovery. What is Prudhoe Bay? Take a map. The size of the one in the front of my book, The Energy Non Crisis. Take the average ballpoint pen. The tip of that pen Place it right there on the Arctic Ocean in northern Alaska. And about the size of the tip of that pin on a map this size, that would be about the size of the Prudhoe Bay oil pool, that one pool of oil capable of supplying two million barrels of oil every 24 hours for over 40 years to fill up the Trans-Alaska oil pipeline at artesian pressure without ever placing a pump on the field. Statement again in the letter from the Department of Interior. No large oil fields have been found in northern Alaska since the Prudhoe Bay discovery. Now, you appear to be an intelligent audience. I dare to say that you would not be a part of the Freeman Institute if you were not, would they, Dr. Skousen? <laughs> you better say yes. <laughs> I offer for your inspection the annual report of the Atlantic Richfield Corporation, <clears throat> dated 1981. I read, quote, mental computers going, Kaparik River Field. What field did they talk about in the Department of Interior letter? Prudhoe Bay Field. By the way, the Kaparik Field is adjacent to the Prudhoe Bay Field on the north slope of Alaska. I continue. Kaparik River Field. Oil production from the 20 square mile initial development area began on December the 13th, 1981. What was the date on the Department of Interior letter? May 7 of the same year, 1981. I continue. By year's end, the field was producing an average of 80,000 barrels of oil per day from 40 wells. You ready for the clincher? Here goes. Kaparik would have the second highest production rate of any field in the United States exceeded only by Prudhoe Bay. 
just in case that didn't send cold chills up and down your spine, I would like to tingle your toes. On the date that the Assistant Secretary of Energy and Minerals of the Department of Interior signed this letter on May 7, 1981 to Bud Thorpe saying, no large oil fields have been found in northern Alaska. On that date, the Department of Interior had already issued the permits to the oil companies to begin production of the Kaparik River field in December of the same year, and the Assistant Secretary of Energy and Minerals knew it. But he intentionally lied in order to discredit the truth that an honest American was trying to tell to the American public. I think at this point, I must pause long enough to state my position, lest I be misunderstood by some. I love America. I believe in America. I stood yonder a moment ago with you and pledged allegiance to that great old red, white, and blue with pride. And I'll do it any day in the week. My forefathers came as did yours many years ago from all over the world, from tyranny and dictatorships and religious persecution. And they came to North America and they conquered the land. Then they drove out the British. Then one day they got together and they said, let's write a will. Let's write a will to manage our estate so we can hand down to our posterity that which we have gotten with our own bloodshed. And they got together that day at Constitutional Hall. And they wrote the Constitution of the United States of America. And as they were walking out of Constitutional Hall, someone heard one of them say, We have just given you a republic. Now keep it, if you can. And we did for 40 years, and then we lost it. We don't have it anymore. Instead, today we have a bureaucracy that's socialistic in its leanings. As I've traveled across America for the past six months, it literally frightens me what I've seen. Because you see, for 28 years' time, I've been a minister of the gospel. And nine months ago, I left what I'd been doing for 28 years. And I decided to give two years of my life to travel north, south, east, and west across America, anywhere I could get a listening audience to tell them the truth while I still had the free voice in a free land to do it. And everywhere I go, I'm finding group of groups of people that are gathering together and they're trying to educate themselves. And they're saying, we are sick and tired of what's coming out of Washington. We've had it. We are fed up. But what frightens me is this. Some of these people don't know what they need. I was a history minor in college. As I look back at history, whether it be Rome or Babylon or Hitler's Germany, I find that when nations grew to a pinnacle of importance, all of a sudden there was an overthrow or a coup in that land, and the fiber of that country was destroyed. And when it was, that country never came back to prominence as the head of nations in the world again. America today, there are some Americans that are asking for an overthrow of this country. We do not need an overthrow in America. We do not want a coup in America. We need in America today a return to constitutional government where the American people can stand with pride and pledge allegiance to that old flag and say, I'm glad to be an American. But I'm frightened over the fact that I believe in less than 10 years' time, one of two things is going to happen in this land. In less than 10 years, I predict that either those who are asking for an overthrow will get it, or you and I who believe in honest constitutional government and decency in Washington will return it to that, and if we don't, we're going to lose it. And when we've lost it, I have a question to ask you, where are you going to run? There is not another free country left on the face of the earth to go to. And when we've lost this, we have no place to run. And I decided it was time that I stay free because I refuse to be a slave. Therefore, tonight, I'm not here to criticize my land. I came here tonight to tell you the truth so that I can stay free 
and you can stay free because I believe we must be informed in order to be a free people. Tomorrow morning at the gas pump, gasoline, 50 cents a gallon. Does it excite you? Put a smile on your face? Huh? By the way, I wonder if we have anybody here tonight from Texas. Anybody here from Texas? No Texans here? You mean that Longhorn State? We don't have anybody? I always love to tell a story on Texans about this time. You know, we Alaskans, we think we're the biggest state in the Union, and we are now. But uh, uh, Texas has a lot of oil. And back years ago, when Alaska became a state, Texas had to take a second back seat. You know, they always had the longest horns on the cattle and the biggest state in the Union. And when Alaska became a state, the Texan and the Alaskan were arguing one day. And the Texan said, you Alaskans had better quit bragging about how big you are. We Texans know we have to take a second-rate seat now. But if you Alaskans are not careful, we're going to send one of our Texas heat waves up there to Alaska and melt you down and we'll still be the largest. And the Texan said, I'll tell you what, if you don't make that brag good in getting that heat wave all the way up to Alaska, we Alaskans will just divide Alaska halfway in two and you'll be the third largest. <laughs> you think there's a lot of oil in Texas? Here's a major publication of an oil company on uh, November 1981, I read. In 1979, the state of Texas oil reserves were around 7.6 billion barrels. Prudhoe Bay, Alaska alone has 7.8 billion barrels, more than all the known oil reserves in the state of Texas, and that's only one pool of oil alone on the north slope of Alaska. I ask you a question, where is the energy crisis? Only one place in Washington, D.C. Could I put a smile on your face? Gasoline, 50 cents a gallon tomorrow morning at the gas pump. Diesel fuel for the big 18-wheel truck bringing in your hardware and produce items, 60 cents a gallon. Jet fuel, 65 cents a gallon. What would happen to the economy of America? Huh? It'd boom, wouldn't it? Yeah, some people are pointing up. That's exactly what would happen to it. I'd like to prove to you right now that tomorrow morning, bright and early, gasoline could be less than 50 cents a gallon. Diesel fuel could be less than 60 cents a gallon. Jet fuel could be less than 65 cents per gallon. And the service station attendant would not take one penny's cut in profit. The oil companies would not make one cent less than what they're making right now. And yet gasoline could be less than 50 cents per gallon at the gas pump. Sound startling? Just in case it is rather difficult to believe, in the latest edition of my book, which we have copies of it here tonight for sale in the back table and also here, I have a printout of what I'm about to read. And just since it will probably be rather hard to believe the statistics, I have the address of the two government agencies printed in the book where you can write to prove what I'm about to say. A barrel of oil, 42 gallons. Traveling down the Trans-Alaska oil pipeline as of the first quarter of 1981 was valued on the world market at $32.50. I'm going to list nothing but the taxes that are paid to either the federal or the state government off of the price of that barrel of Alaska Prudhoe Bay crude oil. Here goes. There's a pipeline tariff from Prudhoe Bay to Valdez of $2.42 off of the price of that 32.50 barrel of oil. There's a one-eighth royalty paid to the state of Alaska of $3.67. There's a severance tax paid to the state of Alaska of $3.50. There's a famous windfall profits tax, thanks to Mr. Carter, of $11.46 off of the price of every barrel of Prudhoe Bay Alaska crude. You thought that was all, didn't you? No, there are two more. There's an Alaska state income tax of 96 cents and a federal income tax of $4.47. And the bottom line is that 74% of everything you and I pay at the gas pump for a gallon of gasoline goes to either the federal or the state government in the form of taxes. Did they ever tell you that? When they wanted to add on the additional 5 cents per gallon in order to fill up the potholes of the interstate system? A congressman tried to tell you this. His name was Mr. Jesse Helms. He started a filibuster on the floor of the Congress. You know what they did to him when he tried to tell you these facts, which never made the news media? They almost ran him out of Washington. The other day, I pulled into a service station. There was a person filling up the gas tank with gasoline right beside mine. And I heard him kind of mumbling under the breath about the price of the gallon of gasoline. And about that time, I heard him say something like this. 
those dirty Arabs. <laughs> I hate myself when I do this, but I went over from a briefcase and I pulled this out. I walked up to him and went down all these prices and the, and the taxes, and then I looked him square in the eye, and I said, by the way, sir, who are the dirty Arabs that are charging you 74% of everything you're paying for that gallon of gasoline? Now, suppose the federal government really wanted to do something about spiraling inflation and exorbitant interest rates and increasing unemployment. What would they do? Add five more cents per gallon onto the gasoline or would they take off their 74% that's already on there and allow the economy of America to start booming tomorrow morning? What would they do? Oh, wait a minute. Let's be reasonable for a moment if you're having difficulty believing my premise already. Think with me about something. Prior to 1973 and the first, quote, announced energy crisis, did we have any problem with spiraling inflation? No. Back in those days, you'd print the price of a product in a catalog and leave it there for two and three years at a time. Today, most businesses don't even print the price of their product in the catalog anymore because by the time the U.S. Postal Service gets it to their consumer, it's already gone up and they're embarrassed. <coughs> How about interest rates? Did we have any problem with interest rates prior to 1973? No. Six, six and a half percent for years. How about increasing unemployment? We had not had an unemployment problem since the days of the Depression. When did spiraling inflation, exorbitant interest rates, increasing unemployment, when did it all start? 1973 at the time of the first announced intentional energy crisis that was perpetrated on the American people for the purpose of controlling the economy of this nation and controlling the people of the nation. Still difficulty believing it? Let's go to another premise. Whoever controls energy controls the size car you drive. Don't believe me? Ask Chrysler Corporation. They're in bankruptcy while the federal government proved it. Whoever controls energy controls how far we drive that automobile. Whoever controls energy controls airlines, railroads, trucking industry, and every manufactured product that comes into our homes. Energy was chosen in 1973 as a method of controlling the people and the economy of the United States of America. Still having trouble with the premise? I'll go a step further. Think of the products that come out of an oil field. You say, we have a glut today. There's plenty of oil around. Prices have even gone down in the 80s and 90 cents per gallon. I ask you, what prices? The prices of what that came out of that oil field? Here we go. What comes out of an oil field? Number one, regular gasoline. Number two, high test gasoline. You say, wait a minute, we still have you. Those have come down. You ready for some more? Propane, has it come down in price? It came out of the same oil field. What's it done? Huh? How about natural gas? Has it come down in price? It came out of the same oil field. Uh, how about diesel fuel for the big 18-wheel truck, number two diesel? Has it come down? No, it's still a dollar and five cents a gallon. Why is it that the only thing that has come down in price is regular and high-test gasoline? For one reason, in order to distract the attention of the masses away from the true issue. Mark my words, there will be another energy crisis soon with long lines at the gas pump, and I say that from very authoritative sources. They have only distracted your attention away from the true issue just long enough to do some things. Well, all of that didn't bring it to a head. I'd like to go a little further. Are you getting tired? No. May I, may I go a little further? Uh, have your electric bills gone up in Utah? Have it? About what percentage have your electric bills gone up in the past year? <clears throat> About double? Yeah. Uh, natural gas bills, have they increased? Have they? I was sitting in the meeting in 1976 on the north slope of Alaska when I heard a group of oil company officials say, every electric bill and natural gas bill of every consumer in the United States of America will start increasing beginning 1980 and will either double, triple, or quadruple by the end of the 80s. I said, wait a minute, gentlemen. This is only 1976. How do you know that? You ready for a startling answer? Chaplain, 
Do you know how much natural gas we have on the North Slope of Alaska? I said, no. How much? He said, we have enough known, proven reserves of natural gas up here in northern Alaska to supply the entire United States of America for over 200 years if every other natural gas well in America were cut off tomorrow morning, and that is at the projected rate of increased consumption. Not at the present consumption, but at projected rate of increased consumption. Well, I said, great. But he said, Chaplain, we have two alternatives to getting that natural gas to the people in the lower 48. Well, I said, what? He said, number one, build a pipeline across Alaska. 800 miles. Alaskan soil, all American. Same corridor as a crude oil pipeline. Not disturbing the ecology at all. And he said, within six months' time of the completion of the crude oil pipeline, we could flood every western state in the United States of America with cheap American natural gas and electric bills generated with gas, natural gas, which he said they can do it any place in the country. Electric bills and natural gas bills will go down starting 1980. Well, I said, fine. What's the alternative? He said, we can put a natural gas pipeline across Canada. Over 3,000 miles, foreign soil, virgin country where there is no car to cut out, disturbing the ecology at exorbitant expense. But I said, surely you wouldn't do that. He said, Chaplain, mark my words. Whoever is president of the United States of America in 1977 will make the decision that we will not be allowed to build that pipeline across Alaska, but we must build it across Canada. What was the decision of President Carter in 1977? <clears throat> After President Carter had made the decision, you cannot build it across Alaska, it must go across Canada, I went back to this oil company official and I said, Sir, what in this living world did that man do that for? His answer, Chaplain, we knew his decision before it was ever made. By the way, Mr. Carter had never been elected yet when that statement was made to me in 1976. He said, we knew his decision before it was ever made, and the decision was made to intentionally keep the natural gas from the north slope of Alaska to ever getting to the American consumer and to industry. And he said it was done because the government knew that no group of oil companies could ever afford to build a pipeline across Canada. He said it was a calculated failure. As a result, every 24 hours at Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, 190 million cubic feet of natural gas are being pumped back into the ground. There are three proven, capped, ready-to-produce gas fields on the north slope of Alaska, Kavik, Prudhoe, Duck Island. Any one well, which had dozens of wells in every field, any one well in any one field is capable of producing 700 million cubic feet of natural gas every day. While by executive order of the President of the United States of America, you have been kept from getting that natural gas and your electric bills and your natural gas bills intentionally started going up in 1980 and they knew it in 1976 and you can't say that I printed it after it happened because the manuscript for this book started its public started its uh, its forming in 1978 startling but true What does the government have against the people that would allow these things to happen? Again, I'll go back to, you ever heard the old expression, hindsight's 2020? Look back in history. Any nation you'd like to pick, from Hitler's Germany to Rome to Babylon, when these nations grew to a pinnacle of importance on the world scene, what happened to them? Men who were obsessed with power mad and crazed with control of people, gained control of those governments, and what did they do? Money was not the factor. They could have cared less about money. But what did they do to those nations? They brought them to their knees, and those nations never again rose to world prominence. 1974, when they began the construction of the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline, anyone remember what it was projected to cost to build that pipeline? two billion dollars. You remember after they finished the pipeline three years later what it had cost to build it? 
12 billion dollars. 10 billion dollar cost overruns intentionally imposed by the federal government on private enterprise oil companies. Now not one cent of federal money or state money went into the building of the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline. It was all private enterprise oil company money. When I first went to the pipeline, one of the first things I saw was a syllabus. It was about yay thick, yay long, and yay wide. It contained all of the permits and guidelines for the construction phase of the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline for its three years. Halfway through the pipeline, some very strange things started happening. Illustration. The federal government started coming in and withdrawing permits that they had issued for the three-year construction phase of the pipeline. One story is in here. The federal government came into the pipeline work camps north of Fairbanks and said, the sewerage systems in all of your work camps don't meet our latest specifications. Therefore, you must take them out and replace them with new ones. Now, north of Fairbanks, there was 400 miles to Prudhoe Bay. There are no towns, there are no people, there are no roads, there was no electrical systems, there's no nothing. It's an Arctic wilderness and probably white man had never walked up there. The oil companies hauled in at their own expense in huge Hercules aircraft at the cost of $1,200 per hour entire cities and built them every 60 to 80 miles apart up and down that 400 mile stretch of the pipeline. They were completely self-contained with dorms, dining halls, electrical systems, surge systems, and the government had said these surge systems will meet our specifications for the three-year construction phase of the pipeline and halfway through they came in and withdrew the permits and said unless you put in ones that we designate, we're going to close the pipeline down. <clears throat> what the oil companies do? They bowed. They hauled them in at millions of dollars of expense. By the way, did you pull up to the gas pump lately? You know who's paying for those sewage systems? Six months before the Trans-Alaska oil pipeline was completed, I saw a very strange sight happening. Almost every flight of Wayne Airlines planes coming into Prudhoe Bay I saw some very elite individuals coming in that I had never seen before on the other two years of the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline. Arab sheiks. New York bankers from Chase Manhattan and Chemical Bank. Mega bankers. Now, it was my job to host guests who came to Prudhoe. That was part of my job as chaplain. It wasn't unusual for me to have breakfast with the International Secretary Treasurer of Exxon, eat dinner with a member of the Board of Atlantic Richfield and host someone else that night. This was just part of my job. These men had never been there before. And I said to the field manager, I said, Ken, what in this world's going on? He said, Lindsay, come on up to my office. I walked in and he said, Lindsay, as of this morning, Atlantic Richfield just completed signing the papers to borrow the worth of the company. I said, Ken, you don't do that. That's financial suicide. But he said, Lindsay, we did. I said, why? He said, you know how much it was supposed to cost to build this pipeline? I said, two billion. You know, he said, you know how much it's cost us to build it? I said, approximately 12 billion. He said, Lindsay, Atlantic Richfield Corporation is bankrupt. We do not have the money to complete the pipeline because of the $10 billion imposed cost overruns that the government has put on us. Three months before the Trans-Alaska oil pipeline was to flow oil. Do you remember what was on the front page of most all your newspapers down here? Walding on the big pipe is faulty. Remember that? There was not a faulty weld anywhere on the pipeline from Prudhoe Bay to Valdez. And after the oil flowed and they had never replaced the welding on the pipe, did you ever see pictures of oil oozing out of faulty wells? No, and you never will, because it was a federal government ploy imposed on the oil companies to try to keep the nine majors of America from flowing oil six months late in the Trans-Alaska oil pipeline because the federal government knew if they kept them from flowing oil six months past flow date, they would put the nine major oil companies of America into receivership and nationalization and it was a goal of the federal government to nationalize the nine major oil companies of America in 1977. At the same time that the mega bankers and the Arab sheiks through the mega bankers bailed out the nine major private enterprise oil companies in the agreement 
to bail them out was you take a member from the board of our bank and you put them on the boards of your oil companies. And since 1977, it has appeared that the federal government, the mega bankers, and the private enterprise oil companies are one and the same because for all practical purposes, they were nationalized in 1977 by intentional, imposed cost overruns by your federal government. I believe that we can spare America. I do not think it's too late. I believe we have time. If I didn't believe this, I wouldn't waste two years of my life traveling nationwide trying to tell the American people the truth. I think there is time to do something about it. And you know who's going to do it? People just like you and just like Dr. Skousen and just like folks up here. You're the ones that'll do it. And if it's done at all, it'll be done by you. One third during the American Revolution was for it. One third was against it and one third could have cared less. And it's only going to take one third and I believe you as a Freeman Institute and a few other good groups in the country can get that one third. Have you ever wondered what happened to the 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence? Five signers were captured by the British as traitors and tortured before they died. Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned. Two lost their sons in the Revolutionary Army. Another had two sons captured. Nine of the 56 fought and died from wounds or hardships of the Revolutionary War. They signed and they pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. What kind of men were they? 24 were lawyers and jurists. 11 were merchants. 9 were farmers and large plantation owners, men of means, well educated. But they signed the Declaration of Independence knowing fully well that the penalty would be death if they were captured. Carter Baxter of Virginia, a wealthy planter and trader, saw his ships swept from the seas by the British Navy. He sold his home and property to pay his debts and died in rags. Thomas McKean was so hounded by the British that he was forced to move his family almost constantly. He served in Congress without pay and his family was kept in hiding. His possessions were taken from him and poverty was his reward. Vandals and soldiers, or both, looted the properties of Ellery, Clymer, Hall, Walton, Gwinnett, Haywood, Rutledge, and Middleton. At the Battle of Yorktown, Thomas Nelson, Jr. noticed that the British General Cornwallis had taken over the Nelson home for his headquarters. The owner quietly urged General George Washington to open fire. The home was destroyed, and Nelson died bankrupt. Francis Lewis, had his home and properties destroyed. The enemies jailed his wife, and within a few months, she died. John Hart was driven from his wife's bedside as she was dying. Their 13 children fled for their lives. His fields and grits mill were laid waste. For more than a year, he lived in forests and caves, returning home to find his wife dead and his children vanished. A few weeks later, he died of exhaustion and a broken heart. Norris and Livingston suffered similar fates. Such were the stories and the sacrifices of the American Revolution. These were not wild-eyed, rabid rousing ruffins. These were soft-spoken men of means and education. They had security, but they valued liberty more. Standing tall, straight, and unwavering, they pledged. For the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Such were the stories and the sacrifices of the 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence and purchased for you and for me, 
the freedom that we have to sit in this room tonight and pay for this fine meal and go out of those doors in a few moments back to our homes with the hope of the great American dream. Thank you.